Hey everyone, this is Calvin Chambers, creator of Icarus Metro Comic, now on Kickstarter, and this is Nerd by Word. Ladies and gentle people, welcome back to a brand new episode of the Nerd Byword Podcast. Today we have a special guest, up-and-coming writer and creator of comic books, Calvin Chambers, who will be here to talk to us about his new Kickstarter project, Icarus Metro Book of Proxy Number 1. But before we get to our Byword Big Talk, it is of course time for some nerd news. Chris, what do you bring to us this week? Well, buckle up, Buttercup, because this one's going to be fun. Uh, The first official trailer of Zack Snyder's Justice League was released on Valentine's Day, and it is exactly what one might expect it to be. With this trailer, Snyder doubles, nay, triples, nay, quadruples down on his vision for what a superhero team-up film should be. The footage is characterized by brooding heroes, CGI destruction that can be described as shoddy at best, a dark side that evokes uh, shades of the Scorpion King, and an entire world illustrated with brown and gray markers. Zack Snyder is nothing if not consistent in his messaging. The trailer opens with Snyder in the director's chair excitedly presenting the trailer and is bookended by a shock-inducing reveal of Jared Leto's Joker at the end of the footage, a character who seemingly enjoys all-you-can-eat ribs at his local barbecue eatery. (laughs) <laughs> Leto's singular line gives a nod, wink, and a noogie to a Joker meme uh, that fans worldwide will enjoy. In a truly enlightening piece by the ringer's Charles Holmes, uh, he details just how this trailer leans into Snyder's aesthetic vision. Snyder famously has not seen and refuses to watch the 2000 scene. Uh, 2017 theatrical cut of Justice League, referring to it as a, quote, monster. Holmes writes in his article, quote, Snyder isn't wrong. The 2017 version of Justice League was Frankenstein's monster. It was stitched together and quickly ripped apart by anyone who touched it. But if Snyder has yet to see what went so devastatingly wrong with the original Justice League, it's hard to fathom how he will avoid making the same mistake. On March 18th, a four-hour version of Justice League will arrive on HBO Max. It will be impossible for everyone involved to hide the seams of the miniseries. So many are waiting for new life to be breathed into a once-abandoned corpse. For now, it's unclear whether Snyder and company are reviving another monster or on the road to redemption. End quote. And now before I kick it to you, Dave, I, I'd like to make a, a, a few things clear. And multiple things can be true here. As we discussed last week, Joss Whedon has proven to be a truly deplorable individual whose words and behaviors are irrefutably inexcusable. However, with that being said, there are elements of the theatrical release of Justice League from 2017 that I did enjoy, and a majority of them were undeniably due to Joss Whedon's vision for the movie. Thirdly, Zack Snyder's vision and ethos for what a superhero film should be, in my opinion completely miss the mark. His films are centered on sensory pleasure, like explosions and excessive violence, beheading, while purging his characters of any emotional depth or true motivation. I understand his borderline obsession with Frank Miller's body of work. It works in films like Watchmen and 300. We know what those films are. But this is Superman and Batman. This is not the same type of story. Essentially, this is like putting all-star Batman and Robin on the big screen. And I'm not a fan of the goddamn Batman. <sighs> so <laughs> so let me preface this by saying that if our listeners are enjoying what they are seeing from Zack Snyder's version of Justice League, then good for them. I certainly don't begrudge anybody their enjoyment of these trailers, and I'm certainly not going to uh, begrudge anybody their enjoyment of his movie, uh, once it is released if you are into it good for you enjoy it uh, art is you know subjective 
I will say also that I love the Justice League. I love DC Comics, and I've read them for about 30 years at this point. I've seen various interpretations of characters come and go, uh, reboots come and go, uh, and different creators come and go. Some of those I've loved and others not so much. The good news, at least within the world of, of comics, is that things tend to eventually reset to what we would consider the default or the classic version of these characters. This particular interpretation of these characters is simply not for me. I don't get excited to see Superman in a black suit, for Steppenwolf to bloodily decapitate Amazons, for desaturated muted colors in superhero movies, for the designs of Jack Kirby to be reinterpreted as bland and generic. I don't get excited to see Jared Leto back as the Joker because I disliked his take on the character to begin with. I'm not excited to revisit a movie I didn't really enjoy all that much to begin with, now twice as long with a bunch of alternate and additional footage. More of something I didn't enjoy is not all that appealing to me. But will I still watch? Sure. I love these characters, and I hope I'm wrong, and that despite the footage released so far doing very little to excite me, that there's a movie here that I will be able to enjoy in some way, shape, or form. There are ultimately, though, two things that trouble me about Zack Snyder's Justice League, and these are the two big things. There are many minor things we could talk about ad nauseum here. But one, the DCEU has been really hit or miss when it comes to capturing the essence of DC's characters. So many people will never pick up a comic book. They only know these characters from the movies and TV shows. And I'd really hate to think that people would perceive this as the essence of the Justice League, this as the essence of Superman, this as the essence of Wonder Woman. Uh, because the League is so much more, is, is so much better than what has been presented so far in Zack Snyder's Justice League. It is, the, the League is miles better and more enjoyable than what even was presented in the theatrical version of Justice League. The other thing is the toxicity of the online community surrounding this movie. It's downright uncomfortable to try to have a conversation and open dialogue about this film without getting piled on by fans of Zack Snyder. Only last week, within the course of 24 hours, I was called irrelevant, obsessed with pretty colors, was st told to stick with kids' movies, that I'm not a smart adult like Snyder's fans, and at one point it was implied that I live a celibate life. Ladies and gentlemen, you are more than welcome to enjoy the footage released for this movie so far. I'm just as free to disagree. There's no need to be unkind and uncivil towards each other. Art is subjective. And in the end, I assume we're all fans of the same thing. The Justice League and these characters. That's at least why I'm here. And that's why I still maintain hope that there's something enjoyable within these four hours uh, of Zack Snyder's vision. But if you're here primarily because you like Zack Snyder and not the source material, then, then that is simply where we have to part ways. Because I'm first and foremost a fan of DC Comics and of the Justice League. That is why I'm passionate about a good, faithful interpretation hitting the screen at some point. Chris, what are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I always go back to our our fantastic and hilarious conversation that we had with Mike Lawrence uh, several months ago. Um, and, you know, the statement that he made when he didn't make one good movie, he didn't like both of his good movies were, were not good. Like, why would we trust him with four hours of footage? He has yet to make a good superhero film. So like, uh, like most of the, you know, the online points and protestations of fans they immediately escalate to insults and attack of you know the characters and the livelihoods of people who disagree with them and it's and it's the classic case of methinks he doth protest too much like you know that this is not high quality if the first thing you go to is insulting the person and and their life you know, because they disagree with you. Um, so it's it's just a hot mess. And a lot has been, you know, made. It, it's, it's impossible not to compare the DCEU to the MCU. 
and and as a you know huge Marvel fanboy, um, you know all the more you know temptation for me to do so. But when I can strip it down, and even as a casual DC consumer, I love these characters. And when I actually get to reading comics and away from this particular interpretation of those characters, I am so pleasantly surprised and 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 so appreciate when you recommended All Star Superman to me by Morrison and Quietly, like it was such a revelation to me, and it stirred those feelings of hope and 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 good fortune. And you know when I when I read a good Batman book that even though he lives in the darkness, he does not succumb to the darkness. He is trying to better the world around him. For for God's sake, why would he stay in Gotham if that wasn't the case? So I, I think they completely miss the point on all of these character interpretations. And And we talked about this in our third episode ever. You can change the story from the source material, but do not miss the essence of the character. And in my opinion, that's probably its greatest crime. It is has missed the core values of these characters completely. And it is regrettable that ultimately any criticism leveled against Zack Snyder's superhero output is immediately interpreted by uh, his fans as, you know, anti sax Snyder sentiment when the, you know nothing could be further from the truth at least in you know for me I enjoyed his interpretation of Dawn of the Dead for example I, it was very different from the original but it was also enjoyable I thought uh, his animated feature uh, Legend of the Guardians was probably his finest movie I enjoyed it a great deal too even though it had you know some of those telltale Zack Snyderisms it's very interesting to see slow motion action scenes and animation um but it was quite good. So I'm not, you know, some kind of like foaming at the mouth, rabid, anti sax Snyder individual. I just really, really like DC Comics characters. I like the essence of these characters. They are what keeps coming, get, gets me coming back over and over again to DC Comics. And And yes, I would love for the general public to see that essence on the big screen well represented. Um the theatrical release of Justice League didn't do that very well. And, and I fear based on the footage release that Zack Snyder's version won't either. And I find that regrettable. Well, we're sticking with DC, but this is a very, very peculiar story that I, I had to check my sources because I didn't quite believe it. Dave, what, what what do you have for us today? You know, many comic book industry insiders dislike the website Bleeding Cool run by Rich Johnson. You know, love it or hate it, the site often manages to use Johnson's extensive industry connections to reveal interesting tidbits from behind the scenes. And a report from last week really got my attention. So it's no secret that DC Comics has been downsizing. Massive layoffs hit the publisher recently, and they don't publish nearly the number of monthly comic books they did previously. The rumor mill has been churning for a while now that corporate overlords, AT&T, like to exploit comic book intellectual property in movies and TV shows, but have little interest in the comic book side of things, deeming it unprofitable. So there are two interesting rumors Bleeding Cool is reporting. First, that DC may be looking to license their characters to other comic book publishers, with Marvel, IDW, and Dynamite all supposedly expressing interest. The real whopper, however, comes in this quote from Bleeding Cool, and I quote, Bleeding Cool has been made aware of plans by big-time DC Comics fans with access to a lot of money, many millions from across many businesses, a collaboration of some of the biggest cheeses who, with a combination of personal wealth and raised capital, are making an approach to AT&T, not to buy DC Comics outright from AT&T and Warner, not to touch the movies, the TV, the games, or the merchandise, but solely the rights and ownership of the comic book side of the publisher, end quote. Now, I don't know how much of uh, of truth is in these rumors, although Bleeding Cool has a decent enough track record, nor do I have a clue if either scenario will actually happen. I am, however, concerned for DC. Whereas Marvel's comic division under Disney's ownership seems to be healthily chugging along, DC has been increasingly diminished. These are some of my favorite characters, as I've said many times, even within this episode. And seeing DC do less and less with them in the medium I love, namely comics, is depressing. 
you know, Milestone is supposed to make its much anticipated return soon. And now it is looking increasingly like this will be a digital only situation because AT&T apparently doesn't want to spring for the cash to print these books. In short, something needs to change for DC. DC has an incredible staple of characters, a long history of excellent stories from top-notch creators. If AT&T is not interested in being in the comic book business, then, you know, do something about it. Poop or get off the pot, so to speak. Chris, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, that's that's for sure. And, you know, I think it's, I think it's an interesting comparison between uh, Disney and AT&T, these two corporate overlords. And I think just from me, just my gut instinct tells me that AT&T is, you know, AT&T and, and the difference being that Disney is still in the entertainment business. You know, AT&T can be sure, but it's not their primary focus. Um they're, they're, they're one of those corporations where the bottom line is financial. And, you know, we talked a lot with, with Ross Ritchie on the last episode of the harsh realities on the corporate side of, of layoffs. And, you know, AT&T and Disney alike had, you know, were, were um, you know, bleeding money and, and, you know, having, you know, to, to cut ties with a lot of folks, lay off a lot of folks. But I think still... The core issue here, as you stated, is there is solid focus at Marvel on the comics arm of things. And 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 I think that's due to the fact that, you know, Disney is still an entertainment business and, and they're and they're still interested in cranking out content. And if for no other reason, as we've used the analogy on, on previous episodes that comic books as a medium are basically the farm system, the minor leagues, if you will, for the film and television division. Like you're, if you're watching WandaVision right now, you can make clear, uh, you know, comparisons to house of M, which was uh, the major comic event of 2005 at Marvel. You can make clear comparisons uh, to Tom King's vision. So, that's prime source material for probably the hottest show um, outside of Bridgerton. I heard it's pretty steamy. Um, that is is on streaming right now. WandaVision is the show that everybody is talking about. Um, even even casual, you know, consumers of nerd content are talking about WandaVision, and that is directly coming from comic books. So it is deeply concerning for me, even as a casual DC consumer, I still have characters that I just adore. Superman has come on strong, you know, due to our conversations. I love Martian Manhunter. I love The Flash. Uh, Batman was Batman the animated series was was a big part of my childhood. So these are characters that that mean something to me. And and to not you know, have the same type of focus on on something that I prefer. I, I much prefer sitting down and binge reading an entire comic series than I would to to watch a show or, or a film with with a few exceptions. So it, it's just it's disheartening. And I hope that something comes of this. Maybe they can come to some joint agreement to where, you know, AT&T slash Warner still has the film distribution rights of the story content to put it in the hands of people who actually give a crap about it you know yeah chris that's the hope um let, let, let's hope that uh, there is a way to save dc comics and you know with a special emphasis on the comics anyways folks that's it for nerd news let's go ahead and take a quick break when we come back we're sitting down with calvin chambers to talk about his new kickstarter project icarus metro book of proxy number one stick around <laughs> Welcome back, nerds. For today's Byword Big Talk, we have a special treat for you. We are sitting down with Calvin Chambers, writer, creator of Icarus Metro. And he has his, the first issue, Book of Proxy number one, on Kickstarter right now. Calvin, thank you so much for sitting down with us. No, thank you for having me. How are you doing today? Oh, it's a fantastic day, wouldn't you say, Chris? Absolutely. So, Calvin, we always like to start our interviews with our guest's nerd origin story. When did you first realize that you were a, a nerd, and what were your strongest influences? Oh, man. Um, 
I realized that I was a nerd, uh, I guess, around elementary school. Um, you know, where I'm from, elementary school ends at uh, sixth grade. Uh, so, so at this time, I remember my teacher at the time said, uh, everybody, you know, we're going to do like a, a, a 30 minute reading session. Um, you know, everybody bring a book to class. And, and this is after, you know, we went through like the school required readings and whatnot. So when we went to this reading session, uh, <laughs> I pulled out, uh, Naruto volume one. And uh, I started reading Naruto, and I was the only person in the class reading manga. And I kind of set the trend for the class because I know there was a couple other people that I started pulling out manga too. And, you know, they were reading it. I was reading it. I was having fun. And, uh, you know, this also uh, seemed different in the eyes of other people. You know, me personally, I started watching Dragon Ball Z. That was my first anime. I started watching it at four years old. And followed by that was Pokemon and Sailor Moon because of uh, Kids WB. So, you know, with this, you know, having that tradition, uh, you know, going to the movies to see Phantom Menace and to see Pokemon, the movie with my father and mother and, you know, growing up, loving that stuff, playing the games, getting my, my Game Boy Color. You know, I, I just I guess I was bred into that uh, nerdum culture, you know, um, I think the word nowadays is uh, uh, I'm a weeb. Uh, you know, being a super anime fan like this, uh, you know, so so with this, I guess that just just stemmed my lifestyle from there, you know, going to Comic Cons, um, you know, indulging in conversations with other otakus, um, you know, playing video games, streaming, you know, writing, uh, writing stories using, uh, you know, in the same format as the stories I read, uh, but with lessons that I've learned in life, you know, so that's you know, that, that's often how I, you know, figured out I was a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> so, so at what point did you decide, you know, I want to make, I want to put my stamp on this. So uh, what set you on the path towards becoming a writer and creator of, of content like this? Uh, so what happened, it happened after college. Um, in college, I had no means of being a writer. Um, honestly, if I, if I like was on the path I am now as a writer back in college, I, I probably wouldn't have even went to college, you know, to be honest, or I went and went, I would have went to college for like English or something, um, you know, to, to be a teacher and then have time to write on the side. Um, but what set me on the path was I didn't think that people had the capabilities, like regular people like me and you had the capabilities of just going out and say, Hey, I want to make a comic book. Yeah, I didn't think that was possible. I thought that the only things out there was Marvel, DC, um, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Power Rangers. Um, you know, I think maybe at the time it was Rick and Morty. Uh, you know, that, that was the most popular one out when I started. So I didn't think it was possible. You know, I went to my first Comic-Con and I saw Artist Alley. I saw a whole bunch of people there, you know, promoting their own works, promoting their own books. And, you know, like, they were full fledged books. They were books that, you know, you see at Barnes and Nobles that you see, uh, you know, at the bookstore, you know, so, you know, just seeing that inspired me. So I did a lot of research. Um, I, I used to have a company, a publishing company with someone else. Um, and we did, you know, make some works and I, that's kind of where I've learned to trade, but everything else was self-taught, um, you know, just figuring this out. And I said to myself, I was like, you know what? Uh, a friend came to me last year. He said, Hey, what happened to your stories? What happened to the stuff that you used to write? Uh, what happened to your webcomic? And I said, you know what? What did happen to it? And I think at this point in time, I was in a little bit of a drought because of the pandemic. So I didn't really have uh, that that flood of inspiration um, that I usually have uh, just going out and about and seeing things. So I said to myself, I said, okay, you know, what type of story can I make that that can uh that can have a message that people can relate to and that would be suitable for all ages you know something that you know kids can read and it makes sense something that adults can read and like ah oh, okay that's that's pretty good you know so i came out with icarus metro um basically i used characters from my past stories and um you know did a little time skip so i don't mess with continuity just in case if i ever go back and 
I, you know, made these these characters adults, identifying different stories, different traumas that they'd face, and uh, you know, just just coming up with a comic book, finding an artist, uh, finding a letterer, finding a colorist, and and just you know, formulating a, a good timeline. Just put this out there. So I mean, here we are. You know, we're on Kickstarter now. And uh, yeah, I'm just glad that this journey led me to where I am at uh, today. Now, you mentioned uh, that you had worked on another book uh, before Icarus Metro. Can you tell us a little bit about that and uh, what kind of the lessons were that you learned from that first experience? Uh, yes, yes. I actually, yeah, I worked on a book uh, before Icarus Metro. It was like a 10 page comic that I put out there um, with a friend at the time. And the the story was was interesting because I wanted to write a a, a short story, um, a one shot, basically showcasing some characters, how they'd react, and, and and what they're about, you know. So I guess it was my first attempt for a comic, and um, I actually wrote a couple other stories. Uh, one I got printed, but I didn't put it out there, you know. Um, it was just like a rough draft, uh, you know, when you produce a piece of work and then at the end you say huh this isn't what i expected it to be uh let me work on something else uh until then so then i started drafting up uh you know icarus metro so icarus metro actually has been uh something that i've been kind of planning for about four years now um but it, it was off and on planning and um i because i was working i was primarily focused on uh, my webtoons. My webtoon is focused on um, some of the other characters in the Icarus Metro area, and basically going through their life before you know things become Icarus Metro, um, showcasing what happens in the world, showcasing how they got their powers, basically their story, and that's what I've been focusing on. I mean, you can you can read it on webtoons. It's called Juice with an exclamation point. You know, it is something you can read. It's nine chapters out. It's a good introduction. Um, I'm eventually going to redo it, but it's a good understanding of the lore of Icarus Metro. Um, so, it, you know, that's like source material that people can just read. Um, I'm actually going to uh, place everything all in one packet uh, for the Kickstarter, release some pages on, you know, Instagram for you to, you know, stay tuned. It's beautiful art, phenomenal art. You know, the artist, uh, you know, great to work with. Uh, it was just, it wasn't, something that I could see long-term. So me, myself, I'm actually, as we speak, in the process of learning how to, uh, you know, draw myself. So definitely want to both merge the the creative writing and the uh, artistic styles together. So so tell us a, a little bit more about Icarus Metro Book of Proxy number one that, that's on Kickstarter now. What is the quote-unquote elevator pitch for, for this particular book? Okay. Okay. Well, Icarus Metro Book of Proxy is about a spellcaster called Simone Stone. Now, she is a parahuman rights activist. She is a writer. And, you know, of course, she's a spellcaster. She's one of the 14 members of a organization that protects Icarus Metro called the Paladins. You know, her together with her team of individuals, some with powers, some without powers, go and protect the area because the world currently is at war. Parahumans, humans, government organizations, underground syndicates are all fighting with each other, fighting for power, fighting for territory. Um, there isn't really much to uh, living outside. So people escape to Icarus Metro. So it's up to the Paladins to protect those in the city, in the area, uh, you know, from, you know, succumbing to what the outside world has to offer. Did you find any challenges um, writing a female protagonist as, as your primary character? And did you do any like research into like the female perspective, you know, as far as prepping for this story? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Um, actually, uh, you know, just, just for, um, you know, like a shout out, and, um, you know, for assistance in this process, my sister, uh, Brianna, she had uh, 
she is the inspiration and she is the source of uh, Simone Stone, a.k.a. the author and the villain uh, Proxy. So I remember saying to her one day, and this is when I was doing the uh, webcomic Juice, I said to her, I said, hey, uh, I want to, because it's, it's funny, being in this, seeing how creative this is, I want like not only inspiration for my family, but I also want them to be part of the process, you know? So I want them to like say like, oh, I, I keep saying to them, hey, uh, I got room for some more characters. Go go make a side story, you know? Uh, can, can you write a story for me? You know, have to, most of the time they say no. Other times they say, I think about it just to, you know, let me leave the room. But uh, my sister, she actually uh, indulged in it for a moment. So she said, you know, what about a character who, uh, you know, can, uh, you know, whatever she writes comes to life or whatever. Uh, she has a special book that whatever, uh, you know, she reads comes to life. And that's that's Simone Stone, you know. So I named Simone Stone after my sister. And, you know, you know, her middle name is Simone. So I named Simone Stone after her. And I, I created the character in her likeness. So I had an artist, you know, use some images of her and sketch a photo of a character. Um, so it's long been developed since then, uh, over the past four years, to a point now where it's, you know, you know, it's a very, you know, good fleshed out character, including Proxy. So that's something that she also had. She designed the, she didn't design the powers, but I did, she designed the character. And I said, okay, you know, character that does this, it can do this. And it, it works with the story because, you know, essentially Simone Stone is such an overpowered character. Anybody who's a spellcaster, like, I mean, I'm a fan of, you know, Dr. Strange, anybody who's a spellcaster is overpowered, you know? So uh, for someone like Proxy, you know, and this is a uh, inside scoop, you know, with the power to uh, take over somebody's mind, body, and spirit, you know, someone, her fighting someone like that, you know, she can essentially become anyone. So, you know, how do you overcome something like that, you know? So, you know, that's that's basically, you know, how I got the, uh, the motivation to write about a female character. You know, I wanted to, you know, work on something with my sister. Um, you know, I got her perspective every way along the writing process, asked for advice. Okay, what would this character do? Uh, how would this character go about doing this? And then throwing my own spin. Because the, the, the purpose of the book is to highlight that, you know, your past actions don't define you. You know, trauma you face in the past doesn't set forth and and set in stone your your future. You know, you you can you can change. You can be uh, who you set out to be, despite uh, faults you may have made. Now you're you're talking here about characters that have powers, but this is not exactly a, a superhero story. Oh, definitely. So. Not. So what would you say are sort of the major influences on this storyline? What are you what are you aiming to create here? Clearly it's not it's not really a superhero tale. So what is this really uh the inspiration behind some of this? Well, I mean, I feel a superhero story is a very cliche. I mean, everybody wants to do a superhero story. Everybody loves superheroes. But when you think about it, when someone says superhero, like like for example, I'm gonna ask you this. When I say superhero, what's the first thing that pops up in your head? Oh, Superman to me, obviously, always. <laughs> Spider, <laughs> Spider Man. See, as far as I see, that's the thing. You know, I'm not trying to loop my characters into this, uh, into those, uh, into that scene, um, because essentially, yeah, they can be considered heroes in some people's eyes, but when they're destroying skyscrapers, fighting villains and stuff, like to those people, they're not heroes. And those are people that's going to be described, you know, as the comic goes on, like, you know, things they do isn't always for the best. Um, and that's going to be some of the themes in it. You know, I would almost say, I mean, to be honest, to be, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the boys, but I would almost say that the characters are, I mean, it's not as dark as the boys, but, you know, I guess the characters personalities are, and how they're uh, viewed is more like the boys. So tell us a little bit um, about Simone Stone. Um, what is her primary motivation in this? Um, what makes her tick and, and what sets her apart? You talked about the, the backstory and the influence of your sister, but like, what is the big statement you're hoping to make with her? Okay. Okay. Um, definitely. 
definitely uh Simone Stone is a calm and subtle um conceited individual. You know, uh she grew up learning how to fight. She grew up uh working for a uh a government organization that taught her how to use her powers uh to the extent that they could, you know, had her solving crisis along uh you know, just around the world. And for her just to be here relaxing in Icarus Metro, someone who's now trying to have a social life instead of just doing, uh, you know, underground work. She she thinks she's the best. She thinks she, you know, of course, she knows that, you know, there are individuals out there that's better than her, including some of including the leader of her team. You know, but she she doesn't think that she can be harmed or she doesn't think she's untouchable. Um, but there are things that, you know, does uh, cause her uh, grief and anxiety. Um, you know, Proxy, I don't want to spoil the story, um, but a little bit about her backstory with Proxy uh, comes into play in the comic. And Proxy has caused her a lot of grief in the past. And, you know, being so, that is someone that, you know, turns her conceited, uh, cocky attitude into mush, you know, when, when, when seen. You know, she sees her and then, you know, she gets emotional. She gets sad. She, you know, she gets angry and, you know, she does what she has to do. So, you know, that is, uh, you know, something that does make her tick. She, I would say uh, she's really friendly when it comes to strangers. She's really friendly when it comes to fans. Um, you know, she's she's definitely flirtatious, uh, but but kind of shy. It's almost like if you... Uh, it's almost like if you uh, were approaching a girl for the first time and, you know, she was very shy, but when you go and, you know, uh, and you know her, you know, she becomes flirtatious over the time if, if she's interested in you, you know? Um, so that's her character. You know, she does have a boyfriend in the comic, um, has a bunch of friends, uh, has a bunch of colleagues, people that, that know her and, um, you know, she just trying to just go through a normal day um, of a parahuman. Uh, and talking about exactly that, um, we're talking parahumans here and supernatural elements. Uh, what sort of a, a, a woke your interest for the first time into the supernatural? What inspired that? Well, you know, like I said before, I, I didn't really want to go into the superhero route. Um, you know, they have powers like a superhero, but, you know, in this world, they're calling it supernatural powers, uh, paranormal powers, uh, because it's not really coming from their their Earth. I mean, it is Earth. It is, uh, you know, I guess you could say this is a, fan, a fantasy version of America. Um, but I, I believe that, you know, it's best to showcase powers coming from a different dimension as supernatural as as paranormal um honestly i don't have any other word to describe it <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the artist that you worked with on on this particular book um how did you connect and and what make what made them the perfect choice for for book of proxy um i was just talking about this earlier with a couple of people it's actually very funny um they had asked me, they said, you know, how do you find someone to work with uh, on your team, uh, work with uh, consistently on projects so everything stays consistent? And I said, well, you have to find someone that shares the same passion as you. Um, I've worked with an animator. I've worked with a comic line artist. And the animator basically uh, just gave me uh, snippets of, of animation that I've wanted from each of my characters. So I, I'm showcasing eight characters in this animation clip that I have on social media. And the artist actually showcasing the, the full depth of the characters within the comic, you know? So, you know, I had to find someone that, you know, one was able to read the script and, and describe it back to me in the manner and, and the lessons that I had. So, you know, when I gave him the script, um, the artist's name is uh, Daniel Cavo. Uh, he's he he read back the message to me of the script, and, and this to me was like phenomenal because honestly, I thought it it would have been difficult to get. And he read it back to me, and I said, "Look, man, uh, when can we get started? You know, I'm ready for you to work on my my art." 
and we got st- we got started the next day and you know within the time period that I wanted he he delivered the art and it was just it was just a phenomenal process you know I, I love working with people where it's not seeming transactional and you know I feel like that's always the best way to build a relationship if it's not transactional if it, if it's you know almost personal you want know, to touch base with that person and and you can actually you know just just chit chat and talk, you know, for the animator, me and the animator became friends, um, you know, me and the, the line artists, line artists is good people. Um, that's just, I, I feel like that the process always starts well. If you, if you take that approach, you know, so for any artists out there, any writer out there that's listening to this podcast, uh, definitely do your due diligence when, when chatting with people and making sure you have the right person for the job. So uh, tell us a little bit about your Kickstarter for Icarus Metro. What are your goals? Uh, what rewards can backers look forward to? What are some of the specifics surrounding your Kickstarter? Well, the goal for the Kickstarter is basically to, you know, recoup costs of a comic, um, spread brand awareness, and, you know, just to fund and get out there the the comic uh, in, a, in a faster pace. So we're looking to have everything shipped out uh, by the end of April, early May. Um, you know, right now, Icarus Metro Book of Proxy is at 68 percent funded, you know, so we're looking and, you know, we have 32 days ago. So we're looking to, you know, just get everything out there. Um, we have some some uh, stretch goals going on. Our first stretch goal is a donation to ALS, um, you know, for the rewards. You know, you can get the digital comic, you can get prints, you can get the print copy of the comic. You can get a beanie hat. You can get a, a Funko Pop. You can get uh, trading cards. Uh, well, not trading cards, playing cards. Uh, and you can just get a lot of, you know, just a different variety of things. So definitely check it out um, and say it's not the right thing for those listening. You know, say it's not the right thing. You know, you know, easily maybe a one dollar support, a five dollar support. Uh, or sharing it to someone you feel that, you know, is in love with comics, is in love with great stories, is willing to try something new, you know, because that's, that's basically what my goal is, to prom- to to put out there my product, my work, so people can always come back to the stories that I'll create. Um, because I feel so attached to these characters that, you know, I'm always going to be writing stories about them and, and showcasing their life because I, as – some people would say life is like a bottomless pit. There's endless stories that people can go through on a day to day, on a week to week, on a year to year. So that's what I'm looking to do for Icarus Metro. Um, definitely put these works out there. Definitely showcase these characters, showcase their life, their stories, and you know to bring everyone else along on this journey. So crowdfunding sites like Kickstarter and Indiegogo and others have, have become extremely popular, um, even among professional published comic book writers. What are your thoughts on that? And do you think uh, like crowdfunding sites like these should be reserved for, you know, people waiting for their big break, uh, people just starting out? Or do you think it's more the merrier? I think it is mainly for people looking to get a big break, uh, people looking to put their original works out there. Because, you know, not only are comics on Kickstarter, you know, I've, I've seen technology on Kickstarter, bicycles, uh, music projects, everything. So I feel like it's for people who are trying to, one, uh, learn better marketing techniques, marketing strategies, and, and, and fund their projects. Because essentially, Kickstarter and Indiegogo, they're, they're no, uh, they're not... GoFundMe, you know, GoFundMe, you're donating for a specific cause, but Kickstarter, Indiegogo, you're donating for a product, you know? So I, I do feel like that is easier um, for people to to pit their works out there, um, you know, and there's no flaw because it's almost like I'm, I'm buying something that I, you know, that I believe in. Uh, you know, I can go to the store today and buy something and not really know who's, who's behind it. I, I don't have a... a a creator biography. I don't have a, a video outlining a product. I don't have any rewards and, and funding this project, you know? So I do feel like, I mean, personally, I love them. I love those sites. I shop on the sites all the time. And I, I'm pretty sure there's other people out there like me that's looking to fund a creator own projects just to say like, okay, this, this comic, like, uh, I'm not sure if you guys heard of the game Temtem, but that game was huge last year. 
you know, and the game hasn't even come out, came out yet, you know. So for them to be on Kickstarter, raise, I'm not even sure, I want to say $200,000, like Kickstarter is there, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, they're there for people to, to start something loving and start something new. You know, personally, I don't think that big companies, companies that can fund themselves should be on those types of sites uh, because they are for the people. But I've seen it. I've seen them on. And, you know, I feel like it's a market for everyone, you know, but you just have to make your place. Now, it seems to me like that that in particular is, is a big struggle for uh, a lot of people first starting out. There is so much on uh, crowdfunding sites these days like Kickstarter. How do you uh, get people's attention? How, how do you kind of rise above the noise uh, to find funding? What, what are some of your techniques uh, to kind of get people's attention on Kickstarter? Uh, well, a lot of paid advertisements. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of paid advertisements because it, 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 it's very weird how um, how Kickstarters work. I mean, recently, I just, I guess... It promoted me to projects we love on Kickstarter. And like that was the best news I've heard today, uh, personally, because I was like, wow, uh, people are actually like really, you know, taking a look, clicking on it. I mean, I wish I had some type of analytics to check, but I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure there's an algorithm in place for that. Um promoting, I mean, it's constant promoting. Honestly, I think I'm promoting too much right now. I'm doing like, like three posts a day. And I'm doing it on all my uh, social media. Uh, so, I mean, ideally, I'm going to actually cut down the promoting. But it's, like like I said, it's all about advertisement. If people see something that looks good, if people see something that they're willing to click on, then they're going to click on it. They're going to learn more about it. Um, so I feel like in order for you to market a Kickstarter successfully, uh, definitely promote your brand. And uh, definitely make sure that, you know, you're doing what you can to, to bring uh, a new fan base in. So you've touched on this a little bit about the extended universe of this world that you've created. But what's your overall vision? Do you see this as a series of one shots, mini series ongoing? What what are your hopes for the future of this thing that you've created? Um, I mean, the, the universe is very big and I've actually like planned out like almost like a, a phase one, like Marvel type, <laughs> type of, um, uh, st story. Um, but I may not go that route. I may, you know, I may feel like, cause remember how I mentioned my web comic, I was thinking about redoing it. I'm thinking mm -hmm. about learning how to draw myself and then redoing the entire manga series on like a webtoons or something. And, you know, explaining the lore, explaining everything I would have explained later on in the comics and then have everything leading up to this Icarus Metro book one. So that's like that's something I'm like idealizing planning right now. I mean, there, there's so much that I have, like so many characters that I have, uh, you know, already designed and not just like descriptions and stuff like the actual character art. Um you know, ready to go and stuff. So it's just a matter of me, you know, making sure that, you know, the stories are fleshed out and having something to do, uh, you know, for them. You know, personally, if someone came to me and said, hey, Calvin, um, I like your stories. You know, your universe is vast. It can be vast. Uh, can I write some characters for them? I was like, yeah, you can write your own little side story. That's cool work with them on that. I, I'm open to that. You know, I have, I have villains. I have an abundance of villains. I can, you know, say, Hey, you know, here's a big boss, you know? So I'm definitely looking to expand the universe. Um, right now, this is more like an introductory to the universe as a whole. And for you to, you know, just get introduced to some of the characters. And then I'm going to hit everybody with a surprise, probably late this year, early next year. So besides, you know, this this vast universe that you've created for Icarus Metro, do you have anything else cooking that you can tease for our audience? Anything else that you can see yourself maybe writing about in the future in a comic book format? Um, well, I have Icarus Metro 2. Uh, Icarus Metro 2 should be coming out. Hopefully I can get that out by, 
Uh, I'm actually going to be doing a break in between two Kickstarters. So once all, everything is situated for this Kickstarter, I'm going to be doing a little break. But actually, by that time, Icarus Metro 2 uh, should be finished. Um, so I hope to get Icarus Metro 2 out by hopefully October um, on Kickstarter. And that way, uh, people can have that comic nice and ready for for um, December for Christmas. So that's what I have cooking right now. Um, you know, like I said, definitely coming back with the web uh, web comic once I, um, you know, become self sufficient in the art itself, and just looking forward to showcasing that to everybody. Just out of sheer curiosity, how? Um... What methods are you using? It's fascinating to me that that you're taking this, you know, artistic approach and teaching yourself. What do you have any particular, you know, um, things that you're using to teach yourself? Any programs or, uh, you know, videos that you're watching? I haven't started yet. Uh, I mean, I have been watching videos on, you know, best techniques, best, um, you know, tools to use. Personally, uh, like. So I'm, you know, I'm only 25 years old. I'm a millennial. Rough thing about being a millennial is uh, I was born uh, between different generations. So, you know, growing up, having to write all the time, pens, pencils, you know, doing everything. Uh, I remember having sketch pads and stuff like that uh, back when I was, you know, learning how to draw as a little kid. And, you know, you you draw Super Saiyans and and everything like that. Uh, But it became a point in time where when I went to college, uh, they said, we don't really want writing anymore. We want you to do all your work on a computer. So me now being that that's been my life for the last almost 10 years now, uh, that's just what I'm looking to do now. Like, you know, get a, get an iPad, get procreate, or Photoshop, started designing artwork myself, drawing on it, using a stylus, because um, I feel like that's something I can always take to go and and do without questions asked. You know what I mean? Do you have any particular artists that you um, find as like influential or kind of that you model yourself? Uh, excuse me, model yourself after not not necessarily you know copying their style, but kind of supremely influential as you're starting this journey. I don't, I don't actually, um, it's because I haven't, I haven't like officially started yet. Um, so I don't have any, any art style that I particularly want to follow. Um, like if it came to animation, I'd be able to tell you. And if it came to writing, I'd be able to tell you like for writing, uh, you know, I love the style of, uh, the creator of one piece Oda. And I love the style of Masashi Kishimoto from Naruto in terms of their, uh, writing um but i guess i guess if we could say art style i would say a mixture between masashi kishimoto from uh naruto akira toyama from dragon ball z and probably neil adams on his uh on his batman and green lantern covers i love i love those artworks all right, as we wrap this thing up, Calvin, where can people go to support you and your work and keep up with your future projects? Where can they find you online? Okay, okay. Well, you know, definitely check me out at Icarus Metro Comic on Instagram. And I'm also on Twitter at Icarus Metro. And you can find the Kickstarter, uh, Icarus Metro number one, Book of Proxy on Kickstarter. Uh, definitely check it out. You can find me at uh, Kunatics on all social media platforms and definitely stay tuned to more writing and more products that I have, Um, you know, definitely looking to share with it all and definitely welcome to bring you into the family. All right, folks, there you have it. Calvin Chambers, the book is Icarus Metro book of proxy number one. Now on Kickstarter, go ahead and give that a look. Calvin, thank you so much for your time today. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. When we come back from our final break, It is time for our patented nerd commendations. Don't go anywhere. And we're back. It is time for probably our favorite part of the show, 
well, in honesty, they're all our favorite parts. But let's go ahead and dig into some nerd commendations. What's the good nerdy media that we have been consuming? Chris, what's on the menu? Uh, for me, it's Middle Earth Shadow of War. So we have waxed poetic quite a bit about Xbox's uh, Game Pass. Uh, I love the feature. It's it's probably the best part about owning an Xbox. So I was scouring you know, the Game Pass catalog, things to choose from, and I found Middle Earth Shadow of War. Uh, huge Lord of the Rings fan. Um, and I had just finished um you know assassin's creed valhalla that i recommended a couple weeks ago so i was basically a video game free agent so i was like hey this looks like something up my alley love tolkien let's go for it so um this is a sequel to um shadow of mordor from 2014 so i have this is the sequel to that so i have not played the series predecessor but the game's prologue does a decent job of summarizing basically everything that happened um, in 2014 Shadow of Mordor. Um, as, as much as you can do in about a minute or two of summarizing an entire game. But um, so I, I don't feel like I lost a whole lot. I get the basic premise of this game. Um, so in this game, players continue the story of Ranger Talion, who is infused with the wraith spirit of the Elf Lord Celebrimbor. So it's kind of a fantastic premise, um, fascinating premise, I should say, of, of these two, you know, characters being fused as one. Like, all of a sudden, like, the wraith spirit of Celebrimbor will leave the body of Talion, and they're, like, standing there next to each other. And other times, they combine forces. It's almost like Firestorm, um, from what I remember from the fa- uh, the Flash series. Um, together, the two have created a new ring of power that does not have any ties to Sauron, in an attempt to defeat the Dark Lord himself. So this, uh, I, I'm not sure of the exact timeline. I would guess this takes place before Fellowship of the Ring. It, it would be my guess because Sauron, Sauron is still in like his tangible form. Um, uh, I'm not as steeped in Tolkien lore as I like to be, but playing this game definitely rekindled that fire for me to to return and finish the books and, and even rewatch the films. Um, yes, even the Hobbit ones. I, I love them. Yeah, I, I, I enjoy them. Um, but my major criticism of the game is also something that made it an easy on-ramp for me to play. It is very ridiculously derivative of the Assassin's Creed franchise. You are sneaking around and um, not assassinating. Their terminology is stealth killing orcs without being noticed. So it is very, very similar in, in a lot of aspects of Assassin's Creed. Um, and that's a series of games that our listeners know is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I've played ev- nearly every one. I actually enjoyed a lot of elements of the film, and I'm excited for the upcoming Netflix series. Um, it's so much of a shameless lift from those games that I've affectionately deemed it Assassin's Creed Middle Earth or Assassin's Creed Mordor. But nevertheless, it made for, like I said, an easy transition, um, having just finished Valhalla. Uh, And it also has that Tolkien and fantasy influence that I love so much that does enough to give it its own flair. Um, Some of the other enjoyable aspects of the game include investigating clues and surroundings to track down orc captains and warlords. feel like a nice detective game. Uh, Forcing opponents to submit to the power and influence of your ring in an attempt to build your own army and take control of Mordor. So there's a lot of strategy involved in that. Um, it's got an intricate set of skills, wraith abilities that are really cool to watch the animations, um, inventory and abilities. Another nitpick that I have though, is that the outfits and the skins, um, I still don't feel comfortable saying skins in in video games, but nonetheless, um, and gear. So, so those outfits and gear, they don't show up in the cinematic cutscenes in the game. So it's a little bit weird. Like they make this whole big thing about unlocking these things, but when you're actually playing the game, um it'll show but then like it's a whole narrative shift when you show up as a different person back in the cutscenes. a little bit weird um nevertheless i've had a great time playing this game and also earning some microsoft rewards points since it's a game pass game um and i'm sitting down uh afterwards with my copy of the two towers fully immersed in that world once again so chris i have a confession Here's my dirty little nerd secret. Ah! I struggled tremendously to get into the Lord of the Rings franchise. 
I've watched the movies. I found them to be all right. I didn't grow up with the novels. I only encountered them much later in life, so I have no nostalgia for them. And although I find them to be good novels, they do not rank among my personal favorites. So this video game sounds good, and in fact, I've even dabbled in it a bit myself. It does assume that you know a bit about Lord of the Rings and care about this world. And of course, although I know a bit, I was really unable to really get invested after about an hour of gameplay. I'm fascinated by the Nemesis system, though, and I would love to see it implemented in other games, too. I could see it working particularly well in something like a Batman game, for example. So, you know, I echo your recommendation for big fans of Lord of the Rings, but for me, yeah, I struggle to get into the story despite the solid gameplay. Yeah, perhaps it's time that I try to give it another world, but yeah, here, here's my dirty little nerd secret. Me and the Lord of the Rings, we're not all that tight. <laughs> well, that's okay, because... Um, it came to me much later in my life. I was in my late teens when I even watched the first films and I haven't even read all the books. So um, I, I read the fellowship of the ring, uh, the Hobbit. I enjoyed immensely. I, I, for me, I, I greatly enjoyed the Hobbit as opposed to the fellowship of the ring. There was a lot of whining by Frodo that I wanted to reach through the pages and just shake him. Um, but um, so, yeah, so I, I can I can definitely respect that. And and if, if, if this is, I guess, like a coming clean, um, I, I've tried Doctor Who and, and I'm a couple episodes in, but I have to definitely prepare myself. I'm not giving up on it yet, but the absolute just bonkers weirdness of me is is an adjustment and it's like nothing I've ever watched. So to each their <laughs> own. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Dave, what do you have for us for this week for your nerd commendation? Well, let's talk about something old and dusty from a book that I really do love. I'm a huge fan of Frank Herbert's novel, Dune. It stands as one of my all-time favorite science fiction novels. I'm particularly excited to see that the novel has been adapted into a major feature film set to premiere later this year. Dune, you know, has a, has a troubled history of adaptations. There was the 1984 David Lynch adaptation, which, although it has its fans, is really a poor representation of Herbert's novel. And then there's also the failed attempt of, and I know I'm going to butcher this name, Alejandro Jodorowsky, to adapt the novel. An attempt so fascinating in its own right, mind you. It even has a documentary feature about it. The adaptation that, to me, has gotten closest to capturing the novel, and my nerd commendation for this week, is Frank Herbert's Dune, a three-part miniseries produced for the Sci-Fi Channel and released all the way back in December of 2000. It was written and directed by John Harrison. It starred William Hurt as Duke Leto Atreides, Alex Newman as Paul Atreides, and Ian McNeese as Baron Harkonnen. The miniseries made the most of its TV budget, featuring some expertly done special effects, especially given that the movie released over 20 years ago. The acting is strong, the story is quite faithful to the novel, and the miniseries format gives the story room to breathe, which... If we're honest, Dune really needs this incredibly dense novel. There are, of course, still problems for diehard fans here, including some additional subplots not found in the books, and uh, how certain names are pronounced. Still, overall, I enjoyed this miniseries a great deal. It still ranks in the top three most watched programs ever to air on sci-fi, and even after all this time, I think it's well worth revisiting. I think it stands as a good primer, alongside the novel, of course, to prepare for the upcoming uh, adaptation that uh, is going to hit theaters and HBO Max. So yeah, Frank Herbert's Dune, produced for the Sci-Fi Channel, is still a really enjoyable experience. So this is a, a novel that I is always on like, oh yeah, I've been meaning to read that list and I have not accomplished that goal yet. So especially with, with the big film, uh, you know, coming up and, and some of the, the acting names attached to it that are, are some of my absolute favorites. It's definitely something that, that I have on my radar. So I'm excited to check this out. I absolutely adore the novel. It stands as one of my all-time favorite science fiction books. So um, I'm a picky guy when it comes to adaptations. Um, but this one was, was quite good. All right, folks, that's it for another new episode of the Nerd Byword Podcast. As always, if you like what you hear, go ahead and seek us out on your favorite podcast platform and give us a subscribe. Also, feel free to drop a review. We'd love to hear what you think of the show. We are, of course, available where podcasts can be found pretty much anywhere, including, of course, on uh, 
Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify. Uh, we are also uh, on TuneIn Radio, uh, and you can find us with the uh, Alexa app as well. Uh, and of course, there's our own website, nerdbyword.com. You can also hang out with us on social media on our Instagram and Twitter pages at Nerd by Word, Facebook at The Nerd by Word. And you can also find us individually on Twitter and Instagram at That Nerd Dave and at That Nerd Chris, respectively. While on Twitter, we are both dodging Snyder Bros um, and their implications about our uh, romantic lives or lack thereof in in their mind. Um, you can also hang out with us at 10 p.m. Eastern every Saturday night for hashtag Drunk Pete and just hang around with a bunch of Spider-Man fans and, and live tweet a comic. Um, and you can also find my mutant ramblings on X of Words, another fantastic podcast. So if you are reading current X-Men comics and you don't know what to do with all of that, all these feelings and, and expressions that you have about the world of mutants be sure to check out x of words as well and as always stay well and stay nerdy the nerd byword is written and produced by chris and dave two nerds with a love of all things pop culture the podcast features music by al Jimenez and show art by ashery design find us at nerdbyword.com and wherever podcasts are available <laughs>